Hello, I'm Avni Jamdar, and I'm the director for Emerald Cities Bay Area. I manage stakeholder collaborations, advance building decarbonization, and develop high-road economic inclusion programs. I have worked closely with many people in San Francisco in the building trades, workforce training organizations, community-based groups, and city departments to advance high-road jobs and career pathways for disadvantaged communities. One thing is clear. We must decarbonize our economy. We have no other choice. The scientists have spoken loud and clear. This is a political and social issue at this point. In San Francisco, I've had the opportunity to serve on the Energy Efficiency Coordinating Committee, on the Mayor's Zero Emission Buildings Task Force, and the Department of Environment's Community Climate Council that provided support for this climate action plan. As we continue to build more in San Francisco, we have to build across all income levels. And we need to make sure it's done green and sustainably. We want to decarbonize our energy grid. We want to build more housing and more affordable housing. And we want to build it close to where people live, work, eat, and play. We need to make sure we eliminate fossil fuels from existing buildings. We want to make sure we're not leaving behind workers as we develop the jobs of the future. A lot needs to fall into place to make sure we're developing the housing and the buildings of the future. Right now, building operations account for 41% of our climate emissions. We have to act, and we have to act now, fast, and equitably. I have been working in the nonprofit space, and we've heard from Debbie, who's in government, but we need all sectors to come together to reverse current warming trends and move our society to a restorative future. It is my great honor to introduce one of our private sector building heroes, Stet Sandburn. Stet is an award-winning designer with a background in engineering and architecture. He's helping lead a movement focused on rapidly shifting away from fossil fuels, creating net zero energy buildings for intensive uses like academic campuses and for often overlooked building types like affordable housing buildings. But Stet is also an activist. Beyond his day job as a principal at Smith Group, Stet spends his free time helping cities pass climate legislation and has spent countless hours helping government and nonprofits. Let's hear from Stet. Thanks, Avni. Um, I'm super excited to be here. Uh, I've heard there are a few questions that folks have on decarbonization and electrification, and I'm here to help answer those. Uh, so building decarbonization is really a broad topic that covers a lot of things. Uh, one of the um, ideas is that we're trying to take all the avenues in our life and start to decrease the environmental impact, so reducing the carbon emissions associated with them. So it sounds really fancy, but it's actually really simple. We're looking at each avenue of our life and seeing what can we do to reduce our environmental impact. For me in the architecture and in engineering industry, my focus is definitely on buildings. So when I'm looking at a building, I'm looking at all the ways that it uses energy, and what are some strategies that we can bring to bear that reduce our emissions uh, for each of those use types. So it can go from domestic hot water heating, to space heating and cooling, even the way that we cook our food. Each one of those uses inside a building, we can actually focus on decarbonization. One of the key strategies that we deploy for our projects is actually looking at heat pumps. They're a great substitute for all those ways that we use energy within our building. So for instead of using um, a typical water heater in your building that might burn natural gas, we can actually use a heat pump water heater. And not only does it have lower emissions, um, it actually is also more efficient and can save you a ton of money. On cooking, we can focus on induction cooktops. Um, it's a cleaner, healthier way to, uh, to cook our food. And again, it can reduce our cost um, and re to reduce your utility bills. So when we look at decarbonization, it's really a broad idea, but each of us can take really specific individual actions to reduce our carbon footprint. Decarbonization is really important for a whole bunch of reasons, but the big one is we're in a climate emergency, and you've already heard a lot of information about how important that topic is right now at this time. And so it's important for us at the local level because each of us can actually take a lot of individual steps that help in the fight against climate change, and decarbonization is really a set of tools that we can bring to bear in our own lives to actually reduce our own environmental impact. 
I guess I could share a kind of a personal story. Um, so I grew up in uh, rural Iowa, so in the middle of nowhere. Um, and if you grew up in rural agricultural parts of the country, um, there's a legacy of, um, of a sort of homegrown solutions-based um, attitude. And a lot of that actually was born out of World War II. Uh, so if you go all the way back to World War II, the war machine is going, we're trying to save the world against fascists. Um, and there was a big movement for victory gardens. So everybody, every house, every community, in front of every schoolyard, everybody had a, what they called a victory garden. And it was, a, it was actually a government program that was um, sort of born out of the people to increase the food supply and actually provide stability during the war. Um, and this was a really important because we were sending everybody overseas. We had this huge need for uh, supplies and food. Um, and these victory gardens were these small things that you could do in your own home that actually had a really big impact for the collective whole, for the whole country. And most people don't realize, but by the end of World War II, almost 40% of our agricultural growth and ag agricultural production was actually be being done at home in local families and local schoolyards. It was just, it was for your own sort of security and independence, but it was also for the greater good. It was providing this huge benefit to the community. And I really see a parallel when we look at decarbonization and electrification. That small acts that we can do at our own home, in our own communities, in our own schools, that actually have this collective benefit of fighting climate change. And so I see this like really strong sort of independent drive uh, that gives each of us that agency or that power to actually impact a really big uh, change in our communities. One of the biggest challenges in decarbonization and electrification is that if, if all, only the wealthy communities are actually able to electrify their buildings and decarbonize, then it leaves everybody else still stuck on this legacy infrastructure. And so if you think about fewer people using the same quantity of in infrastructure, there's a, there's a shared cost that then is going to get distributed over a smaller and smaller number of people and have a bigger and bigger impact on their lives. So one of the biggest challenges that we have in this sort of movement is making sure that we don't just do it for the wealthy, that we bring everybody along with us so that everybody can share in the benefits of decarbonization. Oh, there, there's a whole bunch of things that I'd love to see happen. I think, um, you know, after these last couple of years, a lot of cities, especially in the Bay Area, have had made huge improvements um, around their building ordinances or the laws that govern how we build buildings. So the all-electric building ordinance in San Francisco was a huge milestone. Like, it had ripples across the country. Um, what I'd like to see next is I want us to challenge existing buildings. Like, if you think about it, how many new buildings are being built in San Francisco compared to the existing buildings? I think our next biggest challenge is to take those existing buildings and actually develop programs that help building owners and uh, renters and everybody in the community electrify those existing buildings. That's probably our biggest challenge. And as we do that, as we take new buildings and existing buildings and we electrify them, we're going to start to see some challenges on the electric grid. There's going to start to be a lot of demand and less production. So in parallel, we can't forget the grid. We have to bring the grid with us. And that's um, something that San Francisco is also sort of leading on, is actually making sure that our grid is filled with high quality renewable energy and building the infrastructure that's needed to help electrify these buildings. So those two things in tandem are really what we need to do to actually make a really big dent in our carbon emissions. Um, so there's a lot of folks that, I, and I get this question a lot, there's a lot of folks that are really skeptical about transitioning to an all-electric home. And part of that is because of a huge marketing campaign over the last 30 years to convince people that cooking with gas is amazing. When we actually compare it to the technology that's also available, that's all electric, it's called induction cooking. Um, it, it, induction cooking beats natural gas cooking hands down. And you can look anywhere uh, to find that out, not just from my own family. Like today, you couldn't get my parents to go back onto natural gas cooking. You know, induction cooktops are safe. You can touch them after you've heated. You're not going to burn yourself. So it's really great for seniors. Um, they're really efficient. And there's no combustion on site. A lot of folks don't realize that cooking with natural gas actually releases not only a lot of particulate um, emissions into your home, but also NOx emissions. And those two things are huge triggers for asthma. So if you've got kids in your family and you're cooking with natural gas, that's a huge trigger for decreasing the health of your own family. Um, so if you're cooking a home-cooked meal, how good is it if you're also poisoning your family at the same time? And so we focus on sort of the health benefits, because uh, they're tremendous. 
but also just the ease of cooking and the controllability. Induction cooktops are far more controllable and faster than gas cooktops at actually boiling water or cooking food. So the solutions for an all-electric house actually exist today. All the technology that you need is actually already on the market. You can go down to your local um, home improvement store and actually pick up every single one of the pieces of technology that you would need to decarbonize your home today. Your local community likely has some really good incentive programs that can help you make that switch to a really low emissions, all electric, decarbonized home and save you money not just on the first day where you make the transition, but also for your utility bills going forward. So thank you for inviting me here. I've been really excited to help answer your questions and I really look forward to a climate inclusive future. <laughs>